And we're back for more Leviathan, the last day of the decade. I'm your Gibbs, and we are playing a visual novel. I guess we're reading a visual novel. This is an interesting little, I don't want to call it a game, but uh, I'll call it an adventure. It is a very interesting adventure, and uh, we're going to have to go on this uh, subway at some point, or metro I think it is. In the last episode we talked to this dude here, and he was basically calling us out because he could see the demon, which is kind of crazy. So before we get on our uh, metro train here, we're going to talk to some of the other folks that are nearby. If we kind of span over, scan over there, we do have quite a lot of chit chat to uh, have done. Ah, a strange looking man with a mustache walks back and forth on the platform. Oliver looks at the stranger. A strange man in high curved striped cap and tight striped suit. What the hell? He has no pants. <laughs> Hello, my dear. Why are you staring at me? Why are you calling me dear? <laughs> uh, well, you look like you're really busy. Are you a street performer or what? Who am I? I am a Leviathan citizen. I, my friend, am a person just like you. Your question is rude. Like me? At least I don't walk around the metro without pants. Why are you such an ass, really? All that we have, we owe to the people in heaven. I give them tribute by dressing just like they dress. Those are strange legends. Hi, my dear. And talking about the history that everyone has forgotten. Looks like I'm getting into another pointless argument. Let's talk to this dude. Subway overseer. This city is shit. A hydraulic hissing is heard in the armor. If you only knew where that horrible spell is coming from in the metro, you'd never ride the train again. Where is it from? Cesspools. Burial grounds, beggars' bodies, and the rotting remains of rats and larger creatures. All of it is seeping into the ground. And murder too. The pure bloods are dying from unknown hands, and the bureau does nothing. A hydraulic hissing is heard in the armor. Evidently, the sky is falling, and not for the first time in my lifetime. That's the Metro Overseer. They wear special helmets to see in dark tunnels. Overseers carry corpses out of the Metro and chase away invalids and the infected. Huh, who's this uh, handsome fellow here? The Plague King took the council in his fist and is shaking it. It's for the best. Weaklings will be sifted out and the strong will remain. May I ask you whose master seal this is? First of all, greetings, young man. Secondly, I know where that jeweler's shop used to be. If you exit the metro, head down the street, and then you'll immediately run into it. But alas, the shop has closed. That jeweler, as far as I know, moved somewhere. Hmm. The Lautners were never weaklings. Whatever may happen, the death of Alvis Lautner will not change the balance of power as much as you think. William Lautner is cunning and is still here. He'll find a way to get into the council again. That old dog always learns new tricks. He he he. Uh, did I get a chance to... Ask him about VF? No, I didn't. You don't know whose seal this is by chance. The and F. I do, my dear. I know that stamp is Winfred's Forlows, the famous goldsmith. Look at the earrings he made, and they didn't cost much. Where can I find him? Go to the White Circle Station on the shore of the canal. Winfred has his workshop. The entrance is draped in red silk. You can't miss it. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm glad I actually re talked to him. Okay, let's talk to this person over here. A girl in a cloak. Sir, allow me to speak with you a moment? Huh? Well, all right. You are so nice. My name is Lucille, and I'm a junior novice in the Temple of Leviathan and Crossthem. What do you want, Lucille? I was sent to find an assistant, someone who's nice and religious. Are you religious, sir? I'm afraid that I'm not really. But you are certainly kind. I see it in your eyes. In the Book of Leviathan, there's a verse called The Wonder of Creation. Here is some of the text. A little can fill to the brim. If only... Oh, if you have little faith, the faith you have is full enough to serve the Leviathan's cause. 
I sure will help the seal. Yes, I'll help you. Then listen, sir. Listen to my story and promise not to tell it to evil people. I promise. Have you seen the saints at all, sir? Not the great Cohens or the virtuous elders, but simple yet surprisingly pretty people. I knew one such person well too, but they were like one person, one soul, unspotted and radiant on the inside. Never had twins served in our great temple. They were two wonderful brothers full of faith and goodness. Uh, a dark ignorant came from the cult and tempted the pure soul. He tempted him with filth and wickedness. I don't even want to talk about him. He changed. His soul burned a while, overcoming evil, but he couldn't withstand it and burnt out. The brothers still loved each other. Such true love lives on, even when one person turns into something else forever. Maybe the power of love is limitless, and at times I started to think that the brother's love would return, the wayward brother back to the light. I was the only one who thought that. The aberrants confused him with lying words and told him to kill his brother, and he did it. His brother fought for his life, and protecting himself mortally wounded the murderer, but he was wounded himself and died soon after. The aberrants were furious. They stole the bodies before we could get to them and bury them. We found the master of the aberrant's house and killed the scoundrel. There we found the brothers' bodies. Oh, how they were mutilated. Horribly mutilated. The aberrant abused the twins. He tore the skin from their bodies and made horrible ungodly books. And what did you do? You can't destroy books like that. They're magic artifacts, and you can only turn them into evil or into good. One of the books was damaged beyond repair. Aberration had penetrated it too deeply. We took the second book. The Admiral didn't even start writing in it, and we had a chance to make it pure and holy again. When we finished the ritual, the book, it disappeared into the air. It somehow went right through our fingers, and no one has seen it since. Oh, sir, I do believe that your heart has heard of our cries and suffering. Even if you haven't, I ask you to help me anyway. Take this plaque. I have no idea what it's for. The Cohen who gave it to me just said that it should go into the hands of someone who is ready to help. In the book of the Leviathan, it says, Okay, okay, I'll help you, I'll help you. What do I need to do? The Cohen didn't say. You're certainly find out when the time is right. <laughs> okay. I just wasn't sure if you had anything new. Alright, well, let's go on the metro. The, tor the train's doors are wide open and thick. Yellow steam swirls near the entrance. You can get on the train and go to the next station. Ah, it's a white circle. Yay, I'm on a train. It's animated. And we have a whole bunch of new people to talk to. Yay! Okay, maybe not a lot of new people. Well, I'll talk to this person first. Okay. The decade is ending, and it feels easier to breathe in the city, don't you agree? Um, probably. It was never really hard to breathe. Ah, well, well, no doubt you're an aristocrat, and you've always been able to breathe freely, no matter what. That's the bitter truth of life. What do you mean? I'm not talking about the air. Can I ask you what you think of the Plague's King's Rule? Ah, uh, he's a monster. The Plague King is a real monster. I don't know why he's still on the throne. Yes, exactly. I'm glad that I've met by chance such a smart and caring person. Listen, I want to tell you something. Who are the aristocrats? Don't ask me for an answer. Think for yourself. Ask yourself. And sooner or later, you'll figure out the truth. Aren't aristocrats the best people? Certainly. Don't aristocrats make decisions that will help the country prosper? Again, yes. A group of arist aristocrats gathered together are able to make wise decisions notwithstanding any personal goals of any one of them may have individually. This is true. They are geniuses, and their zeal and ability to think freely should not be limited by anything or anyone. You probably don't know any aristocrats. They all look wonderful from afar. Oh, no, no, no. I know nobles. I work as a clerk for the Ashley Winsmut, and I assure you of her purity and honesty. The Winsmut family are magicians, scribes, and archivists. They're one of the most ancient and famous families in Leviathan. 
I don't know if I would speak of Winsmith's honesty and purity since they made their money selling the secrets of other aristocratic families. What are you thinking about? Allow me to finish what I was saying. So, the aristocrats' ideas are able to transform the country, but only if no one tries to limit their ideas. And now, look at the sky where the dark clouds are swirling. Among them, you can occasionally see the top of the rotting tower. What do you see? Excuse me? A crude, half-mad power governs us. What authority do we have? Think of the council's lower chamber. Wonderful. Every aristocrat has the right to vote. There is also voting in the upper chamber, which is quite wonderful. The nobles take responsibility for their decisions, correct? But what happens above them, over the rule of reason, is what is so terrifying. He's there, that damned king. Just think, he's an absolutely callous, murderous creature. He will rule forever unless we remove him by force. Remove him, you say? You see, you're afraid. How can we put up with a ruler that only instills fear in us? In fact, the nobles themselves are to blame for him ruling over us. You nobles are the ones who put him there. It's time to throw him off, don't you agree? Um, well, I probably look like an idiot to everyone around me, but I would be a bigger idiot if I said out loud that I'd support such ideas. It's dangerous. And if we don't do it, then he'll keep overwhelming you when you want to stop oppression. They'll poison us with a decade. Snarl, break, and destroy everything. Today, just the shadow of the king defiles your authority. Who is he really? A madman who can only kill or let one go home. His reign is ending. Listen, I can introduce you to some people if you just believe a little of what I say. What do you say? I need to think about it. Yeah, okay, I understand. I won't pressure you. Come back if you feel like you want to help. Ooh. More people to talk to. Oliver stops in front of the skinny man with an angry, tired look. What? Uh, okay. Oliver quickly leaves, trying not to look into the eyes of the stranger. A lavishly dressed person in red is arguing fiercely with an old man in light armor made of leather. Oliver walks up closely to hear the conversation. Can't you see that that's not what's happening here? I don't agree with you, you know. However, however, when sedation starts to spread into the streets, it becomes the government's business. Isn't that right? Yes. And there's really no difference of whether it has become the concern of all across them or just one street, because regardless, we need to stop the infection. Immediately, understand? Finger rots, cut it off. Your hand rots, cut off your hand. Your head rots, and that's it. It's no laughing matter, agree? My neighbor, Lucretia, she seemed like a quiet, smart, virtuous woman until recently. She buried her husband last year, and now her son has caught the disease. You know, the decade got him. Evenings, you know, I make a brew of St. John's wort, lay down on the couch with a book, and leaf through the pages as I listen to the city. I open the window and listen. I hear a faint noise. It's as if someone is cutting buttons off clothes and they're piling on a floor. Not falling, but flying onto the floor with a sharp clink. Clink, clink, clink! So I think to myself, buttons, really? Maybe it's not buttons at all. I go out onto the balcony. Our house is built in a courtyard, so you can see the whole yard. I get up, you know, onto the balcony, look into Lucrezia's window, and see that she's throwing something onto the floor, passionately throwing it. You bitch, she says. You whore. Your father was a bastard and mother was a slut who served ignorance, and you're a piece of shit. I stand there thinking, who made Lucrezia so mad? Then I remember the debt. She borrowed money from me for her son's funeral. She borrowed a little, you know, a loan. I got up to her, Lucrezia, I say, I need money and you owe me. Can you repay me? She nods and holds out five gold. And there, the coins are all stripped, striped and contorted with the king on each of them scratched out the king's eyes on each of them with a nail no not a nail but something else you know uh, you know i have never scratched out the king's eyes and coins maybe it was a nail will you show me huh no what are you thinking i don't have that money with me you don't carry those around they look awful as soon as they showed or as soon as she showed them to me i was frightened i told her lucrezia i don't accept that kind of money i need normal coins she turned around and brought some and ever since then, I've been watching her. 
I've seen all sorts of things, and not just things, but hear them too. She blasphemies the king sometimes, and other times pays with scratched coins, and every now and then cries to other old women about how horrible the country is. It's such unseemly behavior. I went to the bureau and they laughed in my face. They said, go complain to the market. Whores and beggars will listen to you. Do you think that's a good joke? There's the infection I was talking about. Today they laugh about des des desecrating coins and tomorrow they'll start doing it themselves. You don't look like any of these brothers, you. Oh, any of this bothers you. You have no soul, you know. Think about Lucrezia's son. Not the dead one, the youngest one. How can a mother like that raise him? He has only one option now, to go to the Society for Eliminating Vice. Maybe in seven years, we'll find out that he has turned into an upstanding citizen. I'll look into it. Well, that was interesting. Okay, so he has nothing new to offer. I want to ask this guy about VF. Okay, so it is. Walk down to the water, shop is along the shore. Oh, Winfred isn't the same as he used to be. He spent all his money, moved to a shack, and is living like a hermit. But his hands are still golden. That hasn't changed. Thank you for your help. Alright, let's get out of here. I think. Uh, maybe we go this way? Ooh. I can hear muffled voices behind the door, and sometimes women are laughing. This house is a brothel. It's one of the many public brothels that belong to the Lautners. Let's go inside! Oh, we can't. Ooh, we can go in here, though. Who's this guy? A hunched over wrinkled old creature sits at the edge of the old boat with a fish rod in his hands. This proto-primal is a beast that looks like a small old cat and it catches fish in the muddy water of the canal. The wet circle is definitely not the most pros prosperous part of the city. There are tramps, beggars, and poor mudbloods everywhere here. And the proto-primals, of course, they can be found everywhere. Oliver goes down to the water and approaches the boat. Hey, it looks like a cat. The fisherman is dressed in rags and is saying something under his breath. Good evening, sir. The proto-primal fisherman looks at Oliver with genuine surprise and fright. He really does look like a cat. Hello, good sir. He licks his whiskers. The proto-primal continues to fish. Where are you? I am nothing before you, sir. I am just a poor fisherman. I come here at sunrise and leave at sunset when I take my rod and go home. So you fish all day long? What else is there, sir? I have a litter of kittens who all need fish. He licks his whiskers. Ah. Uh, wow, these are all terrible options. <laughs> Give me your fish. Take five gold. Oh, let's go. Oliver decides to leave the fisherman alone and leaves. I mean, you know, like, we can beat up our classmate to death and, you know, dispose of the body, but that poor fisherman was just trying to feed his kittens. Okay, so we're about to go inside to this crazy place. Hey, who's this guy? Wow, he's, like, got missing one hand. So what do we have here? I'll look at this for a second. Oliver notices a surprisingly beautiful, finely made horn on the counter of the jeweler's workshop. The instruments look magical and sparkle strangely somewhat on its edge. Oliver gently reaches out to touch the horn in the corner. Hey, Sonny, look at it, but don't you dare touch it with your hands. Do you, do you think I'm blind? If you try to take it, I'll kick you out no matter what aristocrat family you're from. Calm down. I only wanted to know more about this instrument. As if that would keep me from taking it. I don't know how this instrument can help me, but something tells me there's a secret behind it. I might want to buy it. Well, want to purchase it? Okay, I'll take it for 10 gold. Nope, I want 30 for it, and no less. If you try to bargain, I'll raise the price. I would have bought the horn, but I just don't have the money. No, I won't buy it. Is that so? If you don't want it, I won't insist. Come back if you reconsider. Okay, let's see if we can talk to him, though. 
Looking for something, Sunny? I have been doing this for many years. Here in my shop, there are all sorts of treasures. Runes, rings, amulets, and shoes. A master jeweler is standing in front of me. He is a bald, wrinkled old man with a white beard. He looks calm and friendly, but his eyes betray him. He has eyes of a predator. Seems like he's not that simple. I need to be careful around him. Come on, Sonny, are you gonna just hang around in my shop all day? No, I didn't come here to shop. Take a look, maybe you can tell me something about this ring. <laughs> hmm, the seal is mine, but the ring itself is a forgery. It's too poorly made. Forget the damn ring, you better look here, pointing to the showcase. If you want to find the really good stuff, then you've come to the right place. If you buy two, I'll give you a discount. A big discount, Sonny. We can figure something out. We can always figure something out, my friend. The old man obviously doesn't want to talk about the ring. I bet he knows the ring is trouble. But he can't figure out why. Anyway, I have to talk to him about it, whatever the cost. No, those kind of tricks won't work here. I better... It'd be better if I just ask him. Listen, I need only a name, only a name. A name, name. Everyone needs other people's names. And me, I also need something. And really, not that much if you think about it. And what do you need? You. I see. Catch on quickly to things. I want 30 gold, son. Not too much for an old family secret, right? If it's too much, you can work here until evening. And you'll be like my apprentice. Bringing, fetching, getting out of the fire. Hee hee hee. But here's the catch. Don't ask to leave before 8. It's difficult, but... But the secret's worth it, Sonny. If you want to know the secret, just figure out how to pay. I'll work for you. What is it worth? There, behind the shop is the entrance to the workshop. You'll polish the rubies for the necklaces. Also, I have no girly guest house, so you'll work until sunset. Got it? Um, got it? Well... Not bad, so we're agreed. Or did you change your mind? I agree to work for you until evening. Let's go to the workshop. I like you. You do what you say. You're not a lazy parasite. I can see that. I don't know how you got the ring, and I don't want to know. I work, and you help me. Let's go. I'll show you what to do. Oliver goes into the jewelry's closet and polishes rubies for a few hours. I guess that wasn't the best idea. Christian will flip since I'm getting in so late. So, you want to know who ordered that ring, sonny boy? Listen, I'll tell you what I remember. You don't mind if I write down your story, do you? Write it down, dick. <laughs> okay, random. It all happened a long time ago. Those were the good times, not like now. Yes, ten years ago, things were different. Don't think that I'm a grumbling old man, boy. Everything was different then. They knew me, talked about me, made orders. I had money. I had a shop, not this hole. Another shop. It was near Crolston Academy in an alley across from the archive. One day, I was sitting near the window working, and that bloody wind smut brought in a ring that wouldn't fit on her fat finger. She asked me to stretch it a little. I was resizing it when a carriage pulled up to the archive with some nobles in it. One of them was definitely Orhud, a rich man, his fingers in gold, his hair combed back, and a thick mustache like them. From his description, definitely Orhud meant Christian. I'm really on the right track. A woman followed, she laughed a lot, talking loudly and seeming to be drunk. Really, really drunk. What did she look like? Huh? Tall, about 30 years, maybe less. She was beautiful with lush brown hair. She was wearing a strange dress, but really, they ain't dressed like that now, too. That is definitely Mother. They were with another man. I knew him, yes, but I've forgotten his name. I can tell you one thing. That rascal worked as a notary. Damn shitheads. So they all went into the archive. They were gone for 20 minutes and then came out. It seems that they had a friendly dispute. The woman yelled. If I forget, then what? Arwood laughing replied, I've already made you a gift you can't forget. Or do women have that short of memory? Whoa. They came into my shop. Master, before they dressed me, 
What do ladies receive when you want them to remember you? You know, I replied, a ring. Give her a ring and she will remember you forever. And then he ordered a ring for me. He asked me to make a ring for black silver and that the woman could choose the stone. I thought that she would want a ruby or emerald, but she chose amber. Women are unpredictable. That's the whole story, Sonny. Everything really makes sense, but one thing, why are Christian and Mother doing in the archive? Um, do you remember what they said? Did Orvid say something about why they need to go to the archive? I think they were talking about a deal. Yeah, that's it, Sonny. You do know that copies of every document notarizing a deal should be in the archive, right? It's the law. Got it. Thank you. Ah, thank you, thank you. Get out of here, Sonny. Go your way. Do what you want. Don't get me involved. As you can see, I'm in some deep shit, and if something else happens... Whew. All right, well, that was a long conversation, and we are done with this for now. We will take a break, and I guess we'll try and figure out how to get to the archive. Hopefully you're enjoying this visual novel. It has definitely got character. I will say that for sure. And we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching, everyone.